Helping to secure our future, please welcome the Honorable Al Gore and Harvard University professor and former Time Editor-in-Chief, Nancy Gibbs. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for, for joining us and for, for kicking this conversation off. There's something so appropriate, I think, that we should start at such a cosmic level. I think when we, when we think about health, we think maybe separately about our personal health and the health of our planet. And you've made such a point about how interconnected these two things are. So I, where I'd like to start is for you as you've traveled around the world, where do you see the sort of red alarm health crises occurring? They're most urgent right now. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Nancy, and it's uh, and congratulations to Time Magazine. Great to be here with Mark and Lynn Benioff, uh, and great to be with you again. And thanks for the question. the 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 number of deaths related to the climate crisis uh, are mostly from heat stress now, uh, and that's true in the U.S. It's true worldwide. Uh, however, there are many other threats. Uh, Tropical diseases are moving into higher latitudes, including here in the northern hemisphere and the places where so many hundreds of millions of people live. Uh, and air travel has a good deal to do with that, but the places where these diseases like dengue fever and Zika and West Nile virus and unfortunately a lot of others uh, take root and become endemic is affected by the the warmer, wetter climate uh, and the more chaotic climate that we're dealing with. Uh, another large source, uh, about nine million people die every year worldwide as a result of the co-pollution from the burning of fossil fuels, part air, particulate pollution. Uh, you, you know, when you burn coal or gas or, or, or oil, uh, you, we're, we're putting 142 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the sky every day. We're using it as an open sewer, basically. And that's trapping as much extra heat every day, the accumulated amount, as would be released by 500,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs going off e e every day. But the co-pollution of this particulate matter is killing uh, millions of people from air pollution every year. So where, which countries, as you're traveling, do you see getting this right? I mean, really making significant, courageous <laughs> progress. Well, the Scandinavian countries have been leaders in uh, trying to address the climate crisis for, for a long time now. Um, some countries are doing better than others. It's worth remembering that in spite of the catastrophic uh, collapse of policy at the federal level in the U.S., uh, it's really, it's dangerous and shameful what we, we've done uh, under the Trump administration. Nevertheless, 55% of the American people live in states like California and New York State and Washington State uh, that are actually taking some bold steps to reduce this pollution and to try to deal with the health consequences of it. Do you, as you look at how much uh, private sector leaders have been stepping up, yeah. Where, you know, how do you balance the, the public sector efforts versus the private sector efforts, and where, where do you see the most hope? Well, there are more than 200 large global companies now, Salesforce is one of them, by the way, uh, that have set a goal of 100% renewable energy. Uh, I'm on the board of Apple. I'm proud that they've already achieved that goal as well. Uh, and so uh, many business leaders are providing real leadership. However, uh, we need changes in government policies. Uh, and in order to get those changes, we have to change the policy makers in both parties. And I hope that whoever can hear the sound of my voice will make sure they're registered to vote and make sure others get registered to vote. I don't care what party you're in, but please go out and vote. If you care about this climate crisis, make sure that, that this election next year is a wave election in favor of saving the climate. So I actually want to, um, 
one of the things that we depend on in both health and climate policy are experts and scientists and a, and a set of facts that can be commonly built on in finding solutions. So apart from the role of elected officials, can you talk a little about what you think it will take to rebuild some of the scientific expertise in government in order to address these issues when we have seen such attacks on expertise in recent years? Well, f first of all, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, often called the IPCC, uh, is a group of several thousand heroes, women and men uh, in the scientific community who, who work for free, by the way, they volunteer their time. They've done an absolutely amazing job. You're quite right that in some of the U.S. government agencies, there has been a determined uh, effort under Donald Trump uh, to try to drive away the scientific expertise in places even like uh, U.S. Agriculture Department, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, there, there's one saving grace. There, the Trump White House is uh, uh, surprisingly incompetent uh, in trying to pursue some of the, the goals it sets for itself. And so some of these horrible measures that they announce are, are being struck down by the courts. Uh, uh, and, and so it, it's really important that this uh, uh, catastrophic uh, uh, assault on American norms and values and democracy be limited to no more than four years. Uh, you know, it feels as though both issues of health policy around the Affordable Care Act and climate policy have become so much a part of this very polarized tribal battle that, that too often people don't even think they need to bother to, to study the issues of the policies. They just know which their side belongs to. Which tribe they belong which to. Tribe they belong to. Yeah. Which especially around climate makes it very hard to get individuals to take individual action if they think they will be cast out of their tribe as a result. So I'm, I'm wondering, you, you know, with all of your experience as a politician, in addition as a policy leader and as an advocate, of do we need to somehow reframe this debate in a way to take it out of the, the, mm. the tribal context and put it mm. in one. I mean, nobody wants their children to be unhealthy. Nobody wants their environment to be destroyed. Yeah. And yet somehow it often feels like we are not actually talking about what we're really talking about. Yeah, well, um, I bring you some good news. So th this morning, the partisanship that is at hyper levels in almost every other area of policy is now beginning to give way on the climate issue. Uh, Sixty percent of Republicans in the most recent uh, polling indicate uh, now that they, they're well aware that this crisis is real, it's caused by humans, we have to do something about it. Among registered millennial Republican voters, more than two-thirds are saying the party has to change its position and do more. On 56 college campuses, the college young Republicans have banded together to serve notice that if their party does not change on climate, they're gonna lose this entire generation. Overall, about 79% of Americans are now in the right place uh, on climate. We are crossing the political tipping point now. It's more apparent at the state and local level, and as you mentioned, in the business community. But, uh, you know, last year in the elections for the House of Representatives, the results were a bit obscured by the fact that the Senate elections didn't go the way some people who agree with me wanted it to. But in the House, it was actually the biggest wave election in American political history. Uh, that could potentially happen again. Uh, I, I, I hear and see a lot of Republicans changing their position on this issue. And by the way, I think there are two new very powerful uh, advocates. Uh, Greta Thunberg is uh, fantastic. I, I, I'm uh, um, uh, uh, her biggest fan. But the, the most powerful advocate of all is Mother Nature. Uh, in the last nine years here in the United States, we've had 18 once in a thousand year uh, downpours because of the rain bombs being caused by the climate crisis. Uh, and, and by the way, on the health issue, 
it's interesting that more than two-thirds of all the waterborne disease outbreaks in the U.S. come in the immediate aftermath of these rain bombs. Septic tanks uh, over overflow, animal waste facilities, uh, hazardous waste facilities, uh, uh, the coal, coal uh, ash facilities. So uh, th th this is now getting people's uh, uh, attention. Uh, we just had Hurricane Dorian, which was the most violent and destructive hurricane ever to make landfall in the Western Hemisphere. Just last week, uh, Super Typhoon Hagibis uh, in Tokyo. I, I was there in Tokyo training 850 new climate activists, and just a few days after we left, the bullet trains that we took were <laughs> soaked and ruined uh, by, the, by the flooding. Uh, last year, uh, 71,000 people were taken to the hospital in Tokyo because of heat stroke from the all-time high temperature records. 18 of the 19 hottest years ever measured worldwide have been since 2001. The five hottest of all have been the last five years. Yesterday, we learned this year will be the second hottest year in the history of world temperature measurements. And in addition to all of that, I think 2017 and 2018 were two of the most expensive years, something yeah. more than $650 billion in weather-related $653 billion in insured losses. Uh, by the way, that number may go up slightly because of a pending lawsuit in Kentucky. The developers and operators of the giant replica of Noah's Ark have sued their insurer for a million dollars in damages from uh, unprecedented rainfall Seriously. damaging the ark. <laughs> Seriously cannot make this up. Can't make this stuff uh, up. But, uh, so uh, uh, near, near, nearby in Kentucky, the famous coal museum has just put solar panels on its roof to save money. <laughs> What that points to actually is another potential opportunity where it feels so long this debate was framed that you have to choose between the health of people and the health of the planet or the health of the economy. And that now we are actually seeing as the, the price of wind and solar and renewable fuels comes down and yeah. uh, the environmental and economic costs of, of fossil fuels goes up, that where do you see the tipping point if you were doing this in purely economic terms? Um, of doing the right thing is also doing the thing that is going to be most Well, according helpful. to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the U.S., uh, the fastest growing job I is solar installer. And according to the Bureau, for the last five years, solar jobs have grown six times faster than average job growth. The second fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. Uh, the green economy in the U.S. is now many times larger already than the fossil fuel economy. Uh, we're seeing a huge uh, shift toward investments in renewable energy, batteries, electric vehicles, uh, hyper-efficiency improvements. Uh, we are now in the early stages of a sustainability revolution based on new digital technologies like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and much higher levels of precision uh, that's giving executive teams the ability to manage atoms and, pro uh, and protons, the molecules, with the same precision that the IT companies have demonstrated in managing bits of information. I'll give you a quick example. Google has the biggest server farms in the world. Uh, they have cut the energy use for cooling by 40% just with advanced uh, artificial AI. intelligence, yeah. no new hardware required. And, and these kinds of savings are beginning to appear in sector after sector. I, I feel as though, especially as the news about um, climate had become more and more dire, that people were, were increasingly looking for some magic bullet that technology would deliver of um, some invention or intervention that would reverse the trend lines and save us all. Is that, you know, how should we think about the opportunity of technology in addressing these issues without being um, overly optimistic, but being realistic about the extraordinary changes just in the last five years? Well, you know, some uh, technology advocates keep promoting uh, th the idea that what we need is a miraculous new technology that we don't have yet. Well, <laughs> you know, we already have what we need to really get, get started in a big way. Five years ago, electricity from new solar and wind facilities 
was cheaper uh, than electricity from new fossil plants in 1% of the world. Today, five years later, wind and solar are cheaper than new fossil in two-thirds of the world. Five years from now, 100% of the world. Today, already in the U.S., Florida Power and Light just announced shutting down two large natural gas uh, power plants in, in Florida because it's just much cheaper to, to get the electricity from solar and wind now. General Electric out in California, they have a natural gas plant uh, producing electricity, uh, it has 20 years left on its useful lifetime. They just announced they're shutting it down because again, solar is much cheaper. And we're see in places like India, uh, last year, 65% of the new electricity generation in India came from solar and wind. They're getting bids for electricity from solar now for, for 24 rupees per kilowatt hour, a quarter less than the cheapest electricity from coal. In Europe last year, 88% of all the new electricity generating capacity was from solar and wind. This is a revolution that is sweeping energy markets. Uh, oil, gas, and coal are in decline. The stock market knows it. They, uh, some of them are beginning to, to sell off. We, you know, we had subprime mortgages. We now have subprime carbon assets. Unfortunately, about 22 trillion of them, and this presents a huge economic risk. So we need policy to accelerate this transition so that we can stop put, using the sky as an open sewer. And yet it feels like some of the interventions that are most promising are, are very low tech in you know, kinds of sustainable agriculture that you wonder why it has taken so long for that to become such a central part of this conversation. Yeah, typically it takes a few transition years, uh, three to five years for farmers to shift from the plowing intensive chemical intensive uh, agriculture that relies on poisons uh, uh, and, the, and, and soil erosion. Uh, but the good news is there's a farmer-led revolution toward regenerative agriculture, no-till or low-till, uh, with natural uh, recycling of inputs, intensive cover cropping, agroforestry, including silvopasture. The farmers that are taking the lead on, on, in this revolution are finding their farms are more resilient to the extreme events that are now associated with the climate crisis. There is a growing market for organic food in the U.S. and regenerative agriculture practices. Uh, it is, you could say, low-tech, but it's a different way of thinking that gets us away from, you know, what we're doing now in many farms erodes the soil a hundred times faster than the natural replenishment of topsoils. We cannot continue doing that. So um, my friend Raj Punjabi, who we will hear from later today, reminded me that, that we should reverse this question and look at not just what the, the state of the planet is doing to our health, but what our own lifestyles do to the state of the planet, particularly how and what we eat and individual decisions that we make. So can you give all of us some, some thoughts about where individuals can make a difference in, in individual well, decisions? Well, uh, you know, I think it's important. Uh, I've been a vegan for seven years, but I don't uh, proselytize that lifestyle for others. I think everybody has to make their own decisions. Uh, a, a lot of people now offset or triple offset uh, the emissions they can't avoid, uh, uh, that th th they cannot uh, completely eliminate. I drive a Tesla and have uh, a thousand so solar panels at my farm. But here's the thing, Nancy. Uh, it is not fair to put the burden on individuals to solve this climate crisis. Individuals can make a difference and should. Uh, but as important as it is to change your light bulbs to LEDs, it's way more important to change your, the government's policies at the federal, state, and local level. And again, in order to change the policies, we have a pressing need to change the policy makers. Especially, we need to get rid of the ones who have been taking massive amounts of campaign and lobbying money from the fossil fuel companies benefiting from the revolving door, uh, leaving the Congress and going immediately to work as a lobbyist for fossil fuel 
companies. We've got to get money out of our, our political system. We have got to have truth in lobbying so that companies that say we're good guys, we're going to be a part of the solution, don't turn around uh, behind our backs and go and spend millions of dollars uh, uh, helping out climate deniers. W we have to put the main burden on our individual roles as citizens in a democracy. We've got to get involved. In order to solve the climate crisis, we've got to solve the democracy crisis. Well, so then I can't resist asking as someone who had a front row seat on a presidential impeachment drama <laughs> yeah. of what you make of what we So are fun to think back on those days. <laughs> I thought you was like that. Um, but the spectacle that we are seeing right now um, and the possibility of any kind of policy being made in this environment, I'm curious about how you see this playing out in, in these coming months. Not leave aside 2020, but just in the... In the yeah, term. well, it's hard to predict, of course. Uh, uh, reading the tea leaves, uh, it, it certainly looks as if the House of Representatives have, has, has already developed an, an incredible body of evidence uh, that uh, is likely to be used uh, in their uh, upcoming uh, votes uh, on whether or not to impeach uh, President Trump. Uh, of course, uh, most people have assumed that the Republican-controlled Senate would never convict and remove. I don't know. Uh, the, the evidence uh, still matters. Uh, and look, just reading what, listening to what the President Trump has said out of his own mouth when he publicly asks foreign governments to dig up dirt on one of his principal political opponents. That is an impeachable offense. The fact that he does it openly and publicly doesn't insulate it from the legal consequences of breaking the law. So um, I guess that's uh, the direction it's headed in, and, and uh, it's probably still unlikely the Republican Senate would convict. But I don't think it, it's any longer possible to say that's a, a certainty by any means. And by the way, uh, what President Trump uh, did uh, in betraying our longtime allies, uh, the Kurds, uh, in, in, in northern Syria, is a shame and a disgrace that dishonors our country uh, in a way that I, I just think is impossible to accept. I'm hoping that some of my longtime Republican friends in the Senate We'll take a long, hard look at how incredibly dangerous it is to have a man like that as our commander in chief. This is the most dangerous time for America that I have ever experienced in, in my lifetime. And all, all Americans who feel that, that this country continues to play a special role in Lincoln's phrase as the last best hope of humankind, have to really get engaged and get this guy out of office one way or another. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you.